we're really glad to have Nathaniel Rich back at the store. Uh, he, was, he was last year for the mayor's tongue. Uh, but his current book, Odds Against Tomorrow, is in terms compelling, prophetic, frightening, and surreal. Um, I'll leave it to Nathaniel to discuss the book, as there are a lot of spoilers in it. But having grown up in Queens, New York, I really wish he had taken it easier on us in the book. Um, but please welcome Nathaniel Rich. Thank you all for coming out. Um, yeah, so, so can you hear me all right? Hello, everyone. Um, so, one spoiler that you might have been referring to, uh, I think I can reveal since it's on the cover, which is that one of, in one of the uh, central scenes in the novel, there's a massive uh, hurricane, Category 3 hurricane, that hits New York City and uh, causes uh, widespread flooding. And so I've been asked already, um, you know, is this novel your response to Sandy? Uh, did you start writing it after Sandy? Of course, uh, it takes me a lot longer to write a book. This, I started this book about six years ago. Um, and from very early on, I knew that there was going to be uh, some kind of worst case scenario was going to hit New York City. And I, and I figured out, I think, pretty early on as well that it would be a hurricane because I knew that was the most likely. Um, so then I had about five or six hurricane seasons uh, to endure each year, wondering if this was the year I'd have to th uh, throw out the novel. Um, and then at the, in this past, I th and I'd made it through the last hurricane season, uh, which ends, I think, in September, uh, usually. And I was editing the, the final proofs of the novel uh, at the end of October. Um, you know, one night, staying up late one night, editing a scene about the flood, uh, only to wake up the next morning to, uh, to images on cable news of flooded Manhattan. Um, and it was very surreal. And horrifying, of course, to see my native uh, city destroyed. But I was also very selfishly relieved that it wasn't worse. Um, as I knew, and I, as many scientists and, um, and, and people who had been studying it knew, that, that it could be worse, and they, as they know that it will be worse in the future when there are more severe storms. Uh, so I wanted to write a book about um, anxiety about the future and uh, the fact that we live in, at a time when, even if the world is not necessarily worse than it's been before, uh, we, have, we are more constantly reminded of how bad things are, uh, essentially through technology. Um, so I think you know, we're kind of inundated, uh, to use probably an awkward word, uh, with, with uh, bad information, scary information. Uh, and so I wanted to write about both that information and what that does to us, how we, how we uh, deal with it, and, and how we function. Um, and so the original seed for this book came from a, actually a conversation I had with a friend from college. Uh, his name is Alan. Some people in this room may remember him. In college, he was uh, best known for founding a uh, communist magazine called Continua uh, that agitated for a revolution. Um, after college, he went to law school, uh, Georgetown, and then got a job at a very fancy New York law firm, corporate law firm. And he always said, well, uh, we would have lunch in New York, and he always was, would be wearing his suit, and I'd be wearing my uh, torn t-shirt, and I would make fun of him, and he would say, well, actually, I'm bringing about revolution from inside the system. <laughs> Uh, and so one way I think that he thought he was maybe fomenting that revolution was to tell me some sort of insider secrets about shady things that were happening in, in the finance world. And this was 2007. Um, and so I think there was already a sense, we didn't exactly know what was happening yet, obviously, but there's already a sense that something shady was happening. And he told me about this new type of um, consultancy firm that would uh, predict worst case scenarios. And it was essentially uh, creating a, a market in high, uh, in, in catastrophic risk. Uh, this sort of a scheme by which corporations would indemnify themselves if against the, the chance that um, any, they might be sued if, if some risk did come to pass. Uh, and so I totally misunderstood what he was actually saying. I still don't really know what he was talking about. Um, he's like a fancy corporate lawyer. 
I didn't understand the uh, financial issues at stake. But I did use that as the kind of uh, germ for what became this mysterious corporation in my novel called Future World. Uh, that the main character, whose name is Mitchell Zucker, joins. Uh, he's a mathematical genius straight out of University of Chicago who has an inclination towards um, concern about worst case scenarios that he can't control. And so this in some ways is the perfect job for him. He has to, he's paid now to predict worst case scenarios. Uh, and it's also a, a kind of nightmarish job for him. It's sort of the best and worst case uh, scenario for him. So I'm going to read a section uh, where he's at this job, Future World, and he's starting these consultations, uh, consultations and he's doing all the research about these uh, <laughs> scenarios. And, um, and yeah, and he starts to go a little bit crazy. That's, that's the idea. Mitchell began to spend most of his time at the library. He requested books on the engineering of New York skyscrapers, bridges, and highways. He found information that he could draft directly into his fear reports. He learned, for instance, that three quarters of all city water lines had exceeded their design life, many by a century. The suspender bars that held up the Brooklyn Bridge had been snapping with alarming regularity since 2010. If the four ventilation fans on either end of the Holland Tunnel were to break down, drivers would die of carbon monoxide poisoning before reaching New Jersey. More violent crimes were committed in the 34th Street BDFM subway station than in any other, New, uh, any other in New York. On the RFK bridge, there had for many years stood a sign that read, in event of air attack, drive off bridge. <laughs> I should say that every fact is real. This is all accurate. Um, he examined so many topographical and geological maps of the city that the librarian informed him in a hushed voice that he had been added to an F FBI watch list. He printed out stacks of reports prepared by international aid groups and government agencies. He started to think of them exclusively as acronyms. FEMA, USCG, NOAA, NYSOEM, DHS, ARC, DOT, DIA. He devised an acronym to remember all the acronyms, Funny Daddy. <laughs> Mitchell became gluttonous for information. The disaster research he'd done in college now seemed amateur, pathetically incomplete. He'd never had access to such resources before, an endless supply of industry and government reports, internal corporate records, and the use of proprietary software that Chernobyl, that's his boss, had imported <laughs> from Brumley Sansom's risk department. But his greatest resource was time. For 10 hours every day, he was free to devour the raw data of disaster. The more he consumed, the more his appetite grew. The thousands of facts he ingested daily kept out his parents, the emptiness of the spooky, squalid, orange-lit apartment. The facts were thrilling. Manhattan's highest natural elevation was Bennett Park, an outcropping of rock in Washington Heights, 268 feet above sea level. Its lowest point was the Battery Park City Esplanade, seven feet above the Hudson River. A fault line ran across 125th Street, and any day could trigger a magnitude 6 earthquake. Mitchell memorized the Richter scale and its equivalencies. An earthquake measuring 4.0 was equivalent to the detonation of a small atomic bomb. A 7.1 was as destructive as the largest thermonuclear weapon ever tested. About 20 7.0s occurred annually in one 8.0. The only thing in this world that could compare with the propulsive energy of an 8 or 9 earthquake was a previous 8 or 9 earthquake. In the great Panamanian quake of 1882, in 8.1, the force of the tremor broke some coastal homes in two. A young married couple who slept on adjacent single mattresses awoke to find themselves separated by a widening bay, their house split clean in half, she on the mainland, he on a tiny islet drifting away from her into the sea. Hurricanes were measured by the Saffir-Simpson scale, winds less than 118 miles an hour by the Beaufort scale. Tornadoes were charted by the Fujita scale, named after Professor Tetsuyu Fujita of Kita Yushu, Japan, a man known in press reports as Mr. Tornado. Though his work on, through his work on tornado classification, Mr. Tornado discovered a peculiar meteorological phenomenon that he named a microburst. A microburst was a strong, localized air current that caused wind to change direction and speed rapidly. Mr. Tornado determined that this freakish phenomenon was responsible for most unsolved airline crashes. Mitchell had never heard of microbursts before, and he was terrified by the thought of them. The microburst, microburst, a small vector of chaos that could destroy life unexpectedly at any moment, 
For a long time, he paused over the microbursts. FEMA advised American citizens to keep in their homes at all times an emergency supply kit. This kit was to contain a wrench of pliers to disable utilities, a whistle, and a weather radio with tone alert. Books, games, and puzzles were also recommended. Disasters were like crime scenes. After the initial violence, there was a lot of waiting around. If you kept yourself entertained, there was less opportunity for panic. The new information crystallized in his brain. Wasn't this the work he was born to do? His juvenile obsessions had prepared him well. He sometimes wondered whether he could remember details about emergencies more vividly than anecdotes from college or childhood. As he worked, his mind opened up and he plowed himself into it. Brain ate heart. That's not to say he was turning cold or emotionless, just the opposite. The bad news brought a, a rush of excitement. It fortified, too. It reached an intimate part of him. It didn't merely feed his fears. It also fed his fascinations. The information had a way of seeping into his higher thoughts. After a while, he began to feel that he was the information. He went further afield into doomsday prophecy and eschatology. It was tremendous fun. He read Nostradamus, Malthus, Alvin Toffler. He read Prophets, and he read Revelation. Seven-headed dragons, locusts with man faces wearing crowns of gold, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Mitchell loved Revelation. The Christians were excellent worst-case scenarists, even better than the Jews. They were terrified in technicolor, green dragons, swir uh, swirling orange fires of hell, scarlet demons. During consultations, his clients nervously swiveled in their ergonomic, leather-padded office chairs as he guided them through scenes from hell. It felt good to spread the darkness around. Misery liked company, but Misery loved a party festooned with rotting flowers, gaudy b balloons inflated with cyanide gas, human pinatas. Before long, Mitchell had established a repertoire. With a new client, he began by discussing Sino-American military conflict, and for the next several meetings, he rounded out the war quartet with hour-long sessions on Iran, Israel, India, Pakistan, and the Koreas, war gaming, the rapid ascension to regional than total nuclear war. 5,000 nukes were on active, hair-trigger alert all over the world, many aimed at financial centers. Even a small regional nuclear war, such as Iran and Israel exchanging bombs, would kick up enough ash and particulate residue to dim the sun and cause global crop failure. A billion people would starve to death. Buried beneath the Ural Mountains, in the heart of Russia's nuclear command and control system, there existed a doomsday device codenamed Perimeter. Though it was built during the Soviet era, it remained operational. Should Russian leadership be overthrown, a computer would automatically send launch orders throughout the country to nuclear missiles that would fire to all corners of the world. Half of mankind would be vaporized. He then turned to public health scares, the mass production of tainted meats, the poisoning of the water supply, a gas explosion in the sewers, an airborne toxin that escapes from a chemical factory on a windless day and floats into a major city, an explosion at a nuclear power plant, such as Indian Point, just 35 miles from New York. Indian Point sat on the intersection of two active seismic zones, a fact that was not known when the plant was built in 1962. Then there was the possibility of a pandemic. It would originate in Asia, perhaps Thailand. A little girl who tends the chickens on her family farm wakes up with a fever and a headache. The next day she can barely move. By evening she's developed a painful cough. The desperate parents roll her into a, in a wheelbarrow to the nearest hospital, where x-rays show a shadowy white mass about the size of a penny in one of her lungs. The girl dies two, years later, two days later, but not before she has sprayed billions of viral particles into the air around her. Hospital workers carry the disease home to their families and transmit it to fellow commuters on the public buses. A few days after that, a woman boards an airplane uh, in Bangkok headed for San Francisco. She has a headache and a mild sore throat. Within two weeks, 60 million people are dead. Mitchell segued gracefully into a special feature on terrorism, attack by post, bombing by shoe, suitcase or truck, air attack, attack by radioactive agents, suicide bombings on Fifth Avenue and Wall Street. A cyber attack release, releases the account numbers, uh, passwords, and holdings of the clients of a major international bank. A cyber attack reveals corruption in the Supreme Court. A cyber attack launches bombs. Then earthquakes, floods, wildfires, tsunamis. He learned that scientists had detected fault lines in a five-mile volcano situated on La Palma, one of the westward Canary Islands. When an eruption causes the crater and its half trillion tons of rock to break apart and slide into the ocean, and this is a geological inevitably, inevitability, only a matter of time, it will trigger the largest tsunami in recorded history. 
The Great Wave will travel across the ocean faster than an airplane. It will take eight hours to reach the Atlantic seaboard, by which time the crest will be half a mile above sea level, more than twice the height of the Empire State Building. And then that wave will crash. There was also the threats of a, new, of a solar storm that would reset the planet's magnetic field, a deep freeze, hailstorm, hurricane, tornado, asteroid, volcano. There's no volcano in New York City, said Nye Buster, his client. That's what you'd like to believe, replied Mitchell. You would like to believe that very much. Um, Mitchell's mother, decent homespun Ricky in Overland Park, fretted about him. She began to call more frequently. I'm just not sure it's so healthy. The scenarios, he said, they're, they're a type of logic game, a puzzle. These things you're reading so much about, are you afraid of them actually happening? Mitchell bit his lip. No. Ricky snorted. She could always tell when he was full of it. You know your father still has nightmares about the revolution. He's a, from the Hungarian Revolution. I worry you've somehow inherited his fears. Everyone has fears, said Mitchell. It's just a matter of controlling them. You must have fears yourself. Of course I do. So how do you overcome them, said Mitchell. I try to put them out of mind. Avoid a roving imagination and idle reveries. I have a different strategy, said Mitchell. He leaned back in his chair, his free hand gravitating to his head. The hair was getting thinner, it seemed. When he grabbed a fistful and pulled, several strands came away. Was this normal? The orphaned hairs collected on his desk. I imagine a scenario in the greatest detail possible, he said. That way I can figure out how unlikely it is to come true. Fearing the worst usually cures the worst. You're in New York now, said his mother. You don't have to deal with all the little indignities of small town life, slumlord life. Everything is just so little here. Sometimes I feel like a slumlord, said Mitchell. Only the slums are inside me. What? Um, I just feel, stop with that nonsense, said his mother. I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry to bum out all my family members here with a parade of horrible news. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. And the, um, the book isn't all that grim. That's the grimmest part, I guess, the darkest part. You said all the facts are true. Um, is there a point at which we need to know which ones to believe and which ones to not be so sure about? Um, they all are true. And so the question is the time frame. So for instance, there's uh, one fact that's I think not even in that section, but my favorite one that I learned while doing the book is that there's this um, super volcano beneath Yellowstone that has erupted twice. Uh, you can Google Yellowstone supervolcano. Um, and each time it's erupted, it's, it's released this cloud of uh, dust into the air, and everything on life has died. Um, the first time, almost everything, almost near total extinction. The first time it happened was about 1.4 million years ago. Uh, the next time it happened was about 700,000 years ago. So by basic math, you could say we're due uh, every 700,000 years. But really, and there's, you can go to a website at the uh, USGS.com, uh, I think, where they are monitoring it. And so they'll, tell, they'll give us updates if it's going to happen uh, <laughs> soon. And, um, but you know, what, what's the actual likelihood that it's going to happen? And that's sort of what this character does. He freaks himself out. So this is the first part where he freaks himself out with all the bad information. And then, because he's this uh, mathematician, um, he does probability math, and he starts to figure out, well, okay, what are the odds that any of these things are really going to happen? And so, and the odds are actually very low that most of these things will happen in our lifetime. Um, the hurricane would, would be an exception. Uh, you know, one piece of good news, for instance, is that recently we've heard uh, some about how asteroids are going to maybe hit the planet and, and destroy the Earth. I can report... Having done the math myself and talked to people, that's not going to happen. Uh, that, the, the pro that probability is so crazily low that it, um, by the time it, it becomes even at all plausible, we'll be on a different planet or we'll have uh, some kind of 
ability to just you know stop stop it from coming. Um, so you know, in part, what the book is about is is also knowing that there are these all these things out there, and now that, and we have access to all this information. Um, and if you have any inclination to seek it out, as Mitchell does, you can really scare yourself. But the other thing is the other side of that is uh, it's very convenient to obsess about all of this information uh, instead of d- dealing with issues that you actually can control. You know, personal, private issues, um, things like your relationships with your loved ones or your career, um, the way you spend your time. And so it's a lot easier. Uh, for Mitchell or for for anyone, I guess, to spend uh, hours on the USGS website uh, mapping the the caldera, the Yellowstone caldera, and people do this, and they're constantly, you know, saying, oh, "I think I just saw a spike," you know, uh, "this is concerning," that kind of thing. Um, it's a lot easier to do that than say, uh, you know, trying to reach out with someone you've lost touch with or trying to fix your some relationship. And so, I wanted to write about that side of it too, the way that we use these great anxieties to uh, as a kind of convenient way to avoid um, talking or dealing about what's really important in our lives. Yeah, yeah is it, the question was, is there an indictment of uh, media? Um, I don't, I mean, the book, I, I, I didn't want to make it polemical in any way, so it's not... Um, so much an indictment, but I think it there I certainly wanted to reflect that that uh, big fear is big business, and so a big part of this is um, and you know that's in large part because of cable tele- cable news for instance um, internet news websites uh, you know the things that get the most views that get the most clicks tend to be uh, in two categories um, Kardashians and celebrities uh, and really scary things. You know, are we going to, is someone going to launch a nuclear bomb? Is an asteroid going to hit us? Uh, Did an asteroid almost hit us? That kind of thing. Um, And so it sells, you know, fear sells people. And I think we live in a time where, in a culture that's become obsessed by fear. And so uh, I want, yeah, I wanted to respond to that. And and what, what does that do? And and once you become, and then do you become numbed to it? You know, and, and if you do, then is the media trying to just press trying to you know create even greater and greater and greater fears and it becomes a kind of vicious cycle um so yeah that's a part of it um, when the storm finally comes for instance in the book there these meteor meteorologists who've had uh, there's a drought that precedes it are giddy with excitement because finally they they have the rain that they've been predicting uh and so there's a kind of perverse glee in in disaster that i wanted to write about as well Hey, how are you? Good. So um, I wonder also if you explore much about whether corporations induce the fear for profit, and do you ever sort of juxtapose what's happening at this sort of macro level with the kind of fear that I think individuals deal with in terms, you know, if your parents are so worried about their children playing outside, and then we see these images, these horrible images of the shootings in the schools and things like that. So is there treatment also of those issues at the more sort of micro level, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always think of, and this is, this sort of got into the novel in a way, but I have a, I have a good friend who grew up in Illinois, and her mother was v- very anxious as she grew up about um, exposing her to germs, you know, and so whenever she was at home, I think they wrapped the furniture, she wasn't allowed to play in a sandbox, um, and, and the mother was always just washing her hands constantly, you know, and she's developed these horrible allergies has a, the w- incredibly weak immune system. You know, when she gets sick, she's sick for like a year, um, and is 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 you know a smart, successful person, but is very physically frail and and prone to just deb- debilitating diseases. You know, and so um, yeah, I think there's some real there's this sort of over over anxiety that you see manifested in lots of different ways, and. Um, uh, yeah, the other part was, do corporations have some role in this? I mean, in, yeah, in the novel, uh, this company, Future World, is profiting off of fear. Um, and the strange thing that happened after 9-11, which is that it became almost impossible to get catastrophe risk insurance uh, because the companies had to pay out so much money. Insurance companies had to pay out so much money after 9-11 
that a lot of them just stopped offering uh, catastrophe insurance, especially in you know Manhattan or in, in sort of dangerous areas. Um, and so uh, then it, it, there's sort of only a matter of time before someone else filled that gap in the market. So that's what I thought my friend was talking about doing. But then when I wrote the, the book uh, and sort of at the last phases when my editor was asking me, you know, is this actually, could this actually happen? Like, could there, could there be a company, a risk consulting company that does this? Um, I turned to a couple of people. Uh, the first was this uh, a corporate lawyer in New York who said, um, yes, all that you would need is one line in a piece of legislation passed through, say, the state, um, in state law that happens all the time. Like a similar thing happened, I think, after Madoff and after, usually after a lot of corporate scandals, they, they often will add certain lines to like prevent uh, abuses from happening and also but often creating new avenues for abuse. And he said all you would need is a state senator um, probably the one who represents Wall Street to just add that line in and uh, you know he'd probably have to be slightly corrupt but you know as it, tur as it turns out the New York State Senator who represents uh, Wall Street is my college roommate <laughs> so I called him up and he said uh, not only could I do it but I would not need to be paid off at all and or I shouldn't say <laughs> <laughs> I should rephrase I should rephrase yeah um, I saw him last night, and he said, be careful the way you talk about uh, <laughs> this. Uh, he said, state senators do this all the time, and they don't have to get paid off at all uh, because all, they'll just put in little, little gifts to you know, the financial industry um, just in the hope that they will support them next, you know, two years from then. Uh, and that's very common. And so I just put in one little line of legislation to make it happen. But, yeah, I think this is... You know, when we saw what happened in 2008, the, the credit uh, derivative uh, crisis, I think that that there's a similar type of corporate conniving that that was going on, and I think I I think we all have the uh, sense that it's going on in a lot of different ways that we don't know about. Yeah. Well, I'll be lingering around if anyone else has any other concerns or fears. Uh, Okay. Would you mind just going to the microphone? I know microphone? you're private. Oh, thank you so much. It's a short question. Since I know your family so well, what makes you so optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> That's a complex question. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to explain that, yeah. Um, I have to say, I mean, when someone at a previous reading this week uh, when I was talking about, I think, the Yellowstone supervolcano, probably, or you know, new types of pandemics that will be resistant to antibiotics in the coming years, uh, they were asking me, why, why are you laughing so much when you talk about these? Like, why are you smiling? It's like maniacal. Um, and I think the answer is because there, there's actually a lot of kind of fun in, in talking about these things because they're so extreme and crazy um, and high stakes. And yet there's something, and there's something also borderline fantastical about it. Um, because we know that most of these things won't happen, but it's kind of fun to talk about. I, I, you know, I, I spent my, probably a better answer is I spent the ages of 9 to 14 reading only Stephen King novels. <laughs> so that might be part of it. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that, I do think that uh, horror and comedy function in exactly the same ways. Uh, I think things that are often that we think as, of as, as horrific are, are also could be played for laughs. And I remember uh, Stephen King once said that when he's really going on a novel, on a horror novel, when he's really uh, writing something scary, uh, he's sitting at the, ty at the keyboard just laughing hysterically. And his wife is like, what are you laughing about? And he's writing, you know, Pet Cemetery or something hor hor horrific, Carrie. Um, and so that's something I wanted to get at in the book too. This, there's sort of a there's a dark humor that comes out of this. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not as uh, anxious as Mitchell, but I take some precautions. You know, <laughs> I don't use a head. Uh, I don't put cell phones to my head, for instance. Little little neurotic things. Yeah, um, but I I hope I'm. I can assure my family that I'm pretty normal, happy person. Yeah. 
Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, in, in a way, you gave a partial answer, I guess. Uh, I was wondering about uh, whether you uh, trace any of this uh, Mitchell's obsession with uh, these things to his childhood. Were there some aspects of that that you talk about in the uh, the novel? You talk about your own uh, reading Stephen King as a as a child, and certainly one way of dealing with uh, trauma and uh, overwhelming fear uh, is to uh, scare other people. Uh, to be in control of it. Yeah. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Magritte, a variety of other people uh, who were very <laughs> creative uh, managed to uh, scare the readers and the uh, seers of their paintings and so on. Yeah, that's a great uh, observation. I think it's it's true, but right, part, of, part of being able to summon all of this information is uh, at least it gives you the illusion of control. Uh, and in fact, it, there's this one point in the novel where when the flood is, is bearing down, where Mitchell all of a sudden realizes that this is possible, that one of these fantasies might actually come true. And he's doing, he's in a consultation meeting, and he gets, uh, s he gets so worked up that he sort of does the opposite of what he normally does, which is he says, uh, everything's going to be fine. It'll, probably nothing will happen. And his clients are so alarmed by him taking this optimistic uh, approach that they freak out and start and fl flood, uh, flee the city. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big part of it. It's about it's it's about a kind of illusion, create an illusion of control, um, and when really yeah we we don't have one. And it's also about controlling things, uh, having the sense that you can control these vast things when maybe you are really struggling to control, you know, the more intimate uh, crises in in your life. And so that's. That's kind of the path that Mitchell has to go down to, to figure things out. And I think that probably we all do to some extent. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. So thank you to Nathaniel. If you'd like to have your book signed or come up and say hello, please do. Uh, thank you for coming.